Happy Will, do we have it? And what does it mean? That's the question we'll look at on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. In the Deep Space Nine episode, Statistical Probabilities, from Season 6, we have a collection of genetically augmented humans who have suffered unanticipated side effects from the genetic resequencing that has left them institutionalized. Dr. Bashir is meeting with them in an effort to see if he can help them out with their treatment because he's also genetically resequenced. However, despite their handicaps, they are still very talented individuals. They're able to perform astonishing feats of analysis based on watching a short speech by Goldemar, the head of the Cardassians. They're able to determine much of his backstory with a high degree of accuracy. This leads Dr. Bashir to work with them and get them to do some analysis work on an attempted peace treaty with the Dominion. They watch the negotiations and gather all sorts of insights and provide a valuable service preventing the Federation from making a mistake and giving up more than they realize in the negotiations. However, things get out of hand as Dr. Bashir and the others do a series of calculations that lead them to the conclusion that the loss of the war to the Dominion is inevitable, that continuing to fight the Dominion will be nothing more than the waste of lives, 900 billion lives in fact. After their suggestion to surrender is ignored, they attempt to sell out the Federation to the Dominion by giving away a lot of tactical information to the Dominion in an effort to shorten the war and hasten the defeat of the Federation. They're foiled in this plan by one of their own. At the end of the episode, we see Dr. Bashir talking to the other Augments about how all their calculations were flawed and that they failed to take into account a solitary individual making a free choice and radically changing the course of events. The mathematics the group are engaged in to attempt to predict the future bears a striking resemblance to the psychohistory of Harry Seldon in Isaac Asimov's classic Foundation books a science that lets the large-scale behaviour of groups of people be predicted over time to a high degree of accuracy. If you've never read the Foundation books, they're an interesting read. They struggle with this question of future prediction via mathematics over centuries and the problem of free-willed unique individuals. Free will is normally understood as the ability to make unconstrained choices, although exactly what counts as a constraint can vary. The question of free will crops up in a number of philosophical contexts, but it's probably most significant in how it interacts with questions in ethical and moral reasoning, and also some theological questions. There's also a more general metaphysical question to consider, but the primary concern with free will involves questions of moral accountability. If I cannot will my actions, if I cannot choose them, then in what sense can I reasonably be held accountable morally for them? doesn't take very much thought about questions of moral responsibility to encounter questions of intention and motive, and these rely on the ability of some sort to freely will actions. Two terms that will be useful to note are agent and agency. Agency in this context is the ability to make free choices, to possess free will, and an agent is any being with agency. The idea of choice is a difficult one to quantify. It seems obvious that many different things influence the decisions we make. But is the decision we make just the sum of the input stimuli we have? Perhaps mediated by the unique wiring of our brains? Is it all just inputs leading to a particular output? Or is there a part of me that can actually make a choice? If we're just state machines responding to stimuli, then you can see how the idea of moral accountability becomes difficult, because there's literally no one at the wheel making choices. There are three basic approaches to the question of free will. These are libertarian free will, determinism, and a halfway position known as compatibilism. Libertarian free will is the most common sense understanding of free will. In libertarian free will, an agent has free will if they can genuinely choose otherwise. If when presented with a choice, they could have at some level genuinely chosen other than they did. Can I choose cornflakes instead of Cocoa Pops for breakfast? Or more significantly, did I will to pull the trigger and kill someone, or not? This might seem like an obvious idea, but it does get tricky when you try to nail down exactly what a choice is, especially in some sort of naturalistic paradigm that seeks to reduce the action 
of the mind to the biology, chemistry, or physics of the brain. It's worth noting that libertarian free will does not require an ability to do anything that you cannot actually do. I can't will to fly by flapping my arms, or will that I choose other than I did five minutes ago. Although I have met people who have the strange idea that free will requires the ability to be unconstrained in those sorts of ways. Now, I'm hard-pressed to think how this conception of free will can make sense outside of some idea of the mind that accepts some fairly robust idea of substance dualism, although perhaps some flavor of interactionist property dualism would suffice. I don't think any of the monist materialist approaches will allow you to get to libertarian free will, but I could be mistaken. The opposite of libertarian free will is determinism. Determinism agrees with the libertarian free will proponent and insists that to have free will, then you must have the ability to choose otherwise. And they deny that you can choose otherwise. There are a number of different types of determinism, based in physics and the nature of the universe, our peculiar biology or psychology, or even the nature of God and properties such a being may have. The universe as a whole may not be deterministic, and yet we may still lack free will. One aside to note is the question of quantum mechanics. Some think the indeterminate nature of quantum mechanical systems could allow a place for free will. Unfortunately, this won't provide any usable escape for the sort of person inclined to want to make use of it. When it comes to quantum mechanical systems, what we observe is that some things cannot be predicted and exist only as statistical probabilities. You can take a hundred measurements and expect some percentage of them to come out one way and some percentage of them to come out another. But there's no way to predict the specific outcome of certain sorts of events. Does this allow for free will to sneak in, even in a purely naturalistic system? Not really, but it does suggest another novel possibility. It won't work in a closed naturalistic system because the indeterminacy can only mean one of two things. It could be purely observational. The outcome is deterministic, but we lack the ability to measure the necessary conditions to make the determination. Or the outcome is random, with a bias in line with the probabilistic distribution we observed across a lot of measurements. However, even if it's a truly random event, they won't get free will it will only get you some random noise in the system. Randomness isn't choice. Randomness is just randomness. One interesting idea, though, in substance dualism, the complaint is often made that there's no possible way for a soul to interact with a body. Perhaps, and this is completely speculative, in seemingly unpredictable quantum events, we've found the conduit between mind and brain. Determinism, with its inherent fatalism, and libertarian free will, with its genuine choice, aren't the only options, though. There's a middle way called compatibilism. Compatibilism is a position that says, although some sort of determinism is true, that doesn't mean that free will is impossible. Understandably, whatever the compatibilist means by free will, they can't mean ability to choose otherwise. There's no possibility of choosing otherwise because, for one reason or another, all choices are determined beforehand. But, says the compatibilist, this isn't the necessary criteria for free will. What is required is that your choice is not forced. It isn't subject to some sort of coercion. In that case, a choice is free. So if you're controlled by an external device of some sort or otherwise have your ability to choose removed, then your actions are not free. But if there's no external coercion, no overriding of the operation of your mind, then your actions are free. Determined, but freely chosen. The idea is a little strange at first, but I do think it's coherent. I have heard some argue that without determinism, there is no possible free will at all. That your thought processes are orderly and able to evaluate the information it's presented with and react accordingly, whether they are mediated by a soul or just the processing in the brain. What else could choice be but the deliberate determined outcome of a series of evaluations? Far from determinism being incompatible with free choice, it's a requirement for it. The reasoning goes something like this. Whatever this thing is that allows libertarian free will, there is a requirement that the choice has the possibility of being other than what it ends up being. But how is this made? If it isn't the outcome of a deterministic process, then it must be essentially random. That libertarian free will doesn't yield choice, but random noise in the system. I don't know whether I find this convincing as an idea, but it doesn't seem obviously wrong. Where all this gets tricky is when you apply the idea to the moral realm. 
Do you require libertarian free will to be able to be held morally accountable for your actions? Will a compatibilist conception of free will suffice? On strict determinism, it would seem difficult to hold someone accountable for choices they couldn't help making. Although, you could argue that the judge has no choice but to punish them either. Everybody is just acting out the pages of the pre-written script. So where does this leave us with the genetically enhanced group on Deep Space Nine? Their predictive model indicates that doing nothing will result in many deaths, and that by choosing to sell out the Federation, the death toll will be smaller. They're foiled when one of their number betrays them. One of them chooses in a way their predictive model can't account for. I guess it pays to at least plan for unexpected choices. I hope you found this introduction to the idea of free will interesting, and we'll be returning to related themes in future episodes. You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com. You can leave a comment in the show notes at scifishow.com, and you can also leave comments on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash scifishow. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If there's a topic you would like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's Fi with a PH. Let me know what you think. Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 3.0 license, and the music is provided by Furious J and Maniacal M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.